Welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 364 of the Running Field podcast. Thank you for joining me today on this very exciting week. Becoming a Sustainable Runner was launched, was published to the world just a few days ago. And today, rather than going straight to another regular episode, I wanted to allow you to listen in to a conversation between Zoe and I where we reflect on this experience and we talk about the struggles and we talk about some of the really difficult things that we went through together and how we grew, but also how we struggled our way through. Because I know it's very easy in these moments to see people smiling and on podcasts and saying, oh, my book is here. Wonderful. But also to recognize that there is, as always with everything, there are challenges and struggles and hard things to go to to get through that moment. And so I really wanted to us to take that moment on that day, even though both of us were feeling kind of frazzled from trying to juggle all the different things we were working through. So you could really get to hear us connect and hear what we have learned from this experience. So before I get to that, I just want to ask you, if and when, once you receive your book, especially if it, if it, it is from Amazon um, and you are able to leave a review on Amazon, if you email sally at runningforreal.com after you leave your review and it shows up on the website, so sally at runningforreal.com, and I will put a link in the show notes, we will give you either a marathon training plan, a half marathon training plan, or a free audio series, all for free. Um, you can pick one of those, whichever one of these you want in all the different levels. It can also be a life happens plan. Basically, you'll get to pick one of the items on the Running Through website when you send a screenshot of your review and uh, show us that you left a review on Amazon because reviews in the first few days or first few weeks are critical to whether Amazon pushes the book in the months and years to come. So I really appreciate you doing this. I wanted to give you something. If you are someone who has already purchased the book, you are such a gift to me and you are a huge part of why this book has been able to come together. So thank you. And I wanted to say, show something, give you something to show you how much I appreciate you. So email sally at runningforreal.com. Uh, that's F-O-R, runningforreal.com um, with your screenshot of your Amazon review. And uh, you will we will send you a link to whichever of those products you want from the Running For Real shop, either the, the training plans, the audio series, uh, becoming overcoming a menorrhea if you prefer that book. So let's get to the interview with Zoe. Thank you to Two Before for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I'm excited to introduce you to Two Before, which is a sports performance superfood made from one of my favorite flavors, the blackcurrant. This is New Zealand blackcurrant. It's a little bit sweet, a little bit tangy. This berry is going to help you perform better and recover faster by optimizing blood flow efficiency, priming your body to manage exercise-induced stress, something we could all use and uh, appreciate. Now, this is the result of over 10 years of research and development. Uh, two before products are here to enhance your pre-workout nutrition. I have been using it for the last few months, really loving getting to know these products, getting to use them before my workouts. I have really been enjoying the blackcurrant flavor. That is something in England we had a lot. They contain unique levels of antioxidants that have been proven to increase athletic performance and speed up recovery, which can only help us. They have these caffeine and caffeine free formulas. It's, uh, it's clean. It's not got any crash energy. I love to use it uh, with four to eight ounces of water. Uh, you can either mix it with other drinks and that is absolutely fine. I drink it about half an hour before my workout 
and it actually helps me to feel better during my workout. So whether I'm feeling fatigued from just life in general or everything that's going on, I am enjoying being able to use this. Now, as a friend of mine, when you buy a 20 pack of two before at two before.com and you use code Tina, you can get not only 30% off, 30% off, uh, but you also can get free shipping by using code Tina at two before.com. That's the number two before.com two before.com use code Tina to get yourself 30% off and free shipping. If you have some performance goals in the coming months, this is what you need to be using. It tastes great. It's great for your performance and it is a great superfood to just give your body the gift of health. Zoe, my dear friend, it is pub day for us as we are recording this. And can you believe this day is here? Our I can't book believe is it. Out in the world. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I was reflecting on like my earliest memory of actually starting this book. And I remember it being like in April of the pandemic. <laughs> and I remember it, you know, here in Colorado, snowing outside. I remember I like, poured myself like a small glass of whiskey and I'm like, I'm going to sit down and write, like I like typed out chapter one in a word document. And then I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I poured Blinky my whiskey Tessa. out and then I got my notebook out and started like actually sort of trying to like do an outline rather than just hammering away at my, at my laptop. But I mean, that feels like it was almost a, a lifetime ago. I know it really does. Yeah. People ask me what, like when, when did we start? And I'm like, I do remember April being being a factor, but I really don't, even in this, like getting this out process, I'm like, when were we in the thick of it? Because it feels like such a blur. Like, I can't remember. Like, I remember taking the picture, the cover photo with Tony in December, and we yeah. were coming up against the end. This was December 22. We were coming up against the end of it there. But then between that, it kind of is a bit of a blur as to when when we were working on things. And both you and I have been juggling this. And we've talked about how many authors or people who write these books dedicate like a, a year's worth of their time to it. And you and I were like both just scrambling, trying to, to, to get this in and do this as the best we could. But also as with the book, recognizing that it wasn't going to be what these people who can put, you know, a full um, work year worth of time into and being accepting of that. So today I want to do that, like actually dig into underneath and get to the very real raw part of us that that part was for me very hard that I had to know that this book was never going to get to the level that I, for myself, wanted us to be at because we just couldn't dedicate a year to this. So let's start with that for you as this book at where it is. How do you feel about it going out into the world at this point? Um, I actually, so I read, I got my copy last, maybe a, a week or so ago, and I reread the book. And, the whole thing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I actually, you know, I remember when I was looking at it in PDF form, I was just like, oh, this isn't what I want it to be. And I felt a bit more struggle, but and I don't know if it's just like seeing it as like something you can hold or if like mm -hmm. maybe some, you know, like some things like really kind of got changed from like the, the last, like the sort of like final manuscript that I had seen. It just like, it really was reading better to me. It was flowing better. I also have done a lot of work of like, just like acceptance yeah. <laughs> in yes. this time, but like it really hit a little bit differently the last time I read it. And so I'm kind of, I'm really comforted by that. Um, I'm comforted by how many people like have mm -hmm. been enjoying it and that things don't need to be perfect to be impactful and helpful and good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it, it, and like, I, I think, you know, you and I both are, <laughs> I, I've, I've jokingly called us perfectionists in recovery a lot of times, <laughs> but so much of that recovery process is maybe like, quietly hating a lot of what you put out in the world, like hates a strong word, but like having really challenging feelings about stuff you've put out in the world because you want it to be better and have maybe like a flawed perception of like how much time and effort you can realistically give to any one thing while running a business, while parenting, while training, while doing all the things that we're doing. 
Mm, that's so true. And I I will say I do feel better as I haven't read through it again myself, but after I read the audiobook, I felt so like, oh, what if, this is not this is not like more my own stuff. Like, Oh, how did I not catch that? Like things that I had written run on sentences, but seeing it in, in person and being like, wow, yeah, we, this is a big amount of work that we put in here. And it's interesting. You talked about the perfectionism. Um, and actually I really love that you kind of admitted there for both of us about it, like you quietly annoyed at yourself because it's like stage one is like you, uh, you still are at, um, audibly angry at yourself and saying, oh, this isn't good enough. And then we've like, it's kind of like almost fake perfectionism in recovery. We are like, oh, I don't care anymore, but really I do. Um, but it, we have been working through that. And, and um, this is something I've thought about a lot recently. I'm sure you've had the same, but I've had a lot of people come up to me over the last few months and say about writing a book. And they're like, oh, I've got this idea and I've done all this research and, and I've done this and I've done that and I've organized this and I'm using this app and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you just need to start typing. Like you can't spend six months of time doing all the research, all the prep, all the this, all the that, because you, you're just looking for excuses not to actually do it. And so that was where this really forced me into just doing that and then going in it from the other end. And so have you had a similar experience in that way of, um, you know, you hear people say, if you shoot for perfection, you'll never get it out there. Oh yeah. I think like a, a Stephen a Stephen King, one of my favorite writers, and someone who's written really eloquently about writing. He um, he says that the uh, the art of writing is the art of applying the seat of your pants to the seat of your chair. Um, <laughs> and I had a post it note above my desk for so long that just said "ass in the chair" because that is <laughs> so much of what this has been. It has been a lot of days of ass in the chair. And it's not super glamorous and no one is going to like, you know, I, I was, I was, I was just writing on a, uh, working on a piece for free trail about how the, one of the differences between ultra running and writing a book, even though they're both like kind of long-term grindy projects, when you're running an ultra, you've got all sorts of people out there supporting you, cheering you on, handing you snacks. And with a book, it's kind of just you. And like, thankfully we had each other throughout this process to encourage and keep going. And I felt a profound sense of accountability to you through this process. And you gave, you called me in more than, a, a, you know, more than, um, a couple times, but it takes a lot of discipline to apply the seat of your pants to mm. the seat of your chair day after day after day. Uh, and that's like, it's so much of just like, yeah, hammering away on the keyboard. Yes. So true. And there's so many moments for, for listeners where, I mean, we all have this in our lives in general, but in a book, it's so much easier to do, especially in those stages where you're editing and, and it's, uh, to not be like, Oh, you know, I really need to do laundry because I need this shirt for tomorrow. So I, I better do it now because da, 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 or like, you know what? I think I'm hungry. So maybe I should get myself a snack. Cause if I'm fueled, then I'm going to be typing better. And then you get distracted by, Oh, well, I'm down here. I see some crumbs on the floor. I'm just going to vacuum those up. Um, and you'll find any excuse to not go back to it. And I've talked a little bit, I uh, can't remember somewhere about how for me, one of the hardest things was the, the editing and the skimming that I started to do with, especially in that editing process mm. where you, and we talked about this on one of the podcasts, I can't remember where you start being like, yeah, 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 yep, 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 yep. And you're not even reading it anymore, but you kind of become so numb to it that you can't take it in anymore. And that is when, for me, the excuses were at their highest because I was like, well, this is good. You know, this is, I've read this, it's all good. Um, but you can always go back and do it again. And you can, you can always make changes. It's just so hard in those later stages where you are trying to remember what you recently read versus what you read in a previous chapter and keeping it all organized. It is a, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. And it takes, it takes like a lot of, you know, being able to, you know, zoom out and see the forest for the trees and then occasionally zoom in and really focus on one single tree. And you kind of have to hold those two sort of objectives at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, again, like it was so helpful to have a co-writer in this process to like yes. bounce ideas off of for us to like sort of, 
tweak. And I think one of the coolest things was sort of the process of us, like the way that we sort of reached our communal voice was like we would each person would start a specific chapter, then we would essentially swap. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was such a good exercise for both of us, because even though we are really similar in a lot of regards, like any two separate autonomous people, our voices are not the same. And that's Mm -hmm. why they're really great and unique. But we wanted the book to not feel like this weird, disparate sort of document of two discrete voices, but of like a singular Mm -hmm. voice and vision. And that Mm -hmm. was an immense challenge, but it also definitely got a lot easier at the end. And I think both of us had to, or at least I personally had to like, you know, wrestle with ego and like wrestle with values and wrestle with how like I struggle with perception management and I want to like manage how people perceive me on the page. Mm -hmm. And you have to relinquish a lot of that control, not just when you're co-writing something, but anytime you're writing something because half of the experience is what you write and the other half is how the reader interprets your writing. And so I think that was both a challenge and a really humbling and freeing opportunity. Mm. And do you, do you feel like there are, you've, you've said about that you've learned about that. Do you feel, what, what other lessons do you feel that you learned during this process that you feel like you're going to be able to take on with you? Yeah, I think, you know, something that like, just like in the, the background of this is like, Working as a journalist and a female journalist in the world of endurance Mm -hmm. sports, I was dealing with some pretty intensive harassment and really struggled with owning my voice because anytime I put my voice out in the world, it was getting a lot of really just like gnarly challenging pushback. But yet to get this book created, I had to really invest in and push, like continue to push my voice forward and push it out there. Um, So that was really scary for me and like challenging because at work, I was kind of encountering this feeling of just like total self-censorship. Like I just wasn't going to write anything. I just felt like anytime I did anything, it was ammunition for people who Mm -hmm. don't care about me. And I had to, in order to get this project done, I had to continue to show up vulnerably, authentically, imperfectly, and just accept that, you know, some people in in bad faith are going to interpret it however they're going to interpret it, but that our shared vision um, transcended that discomfort. And my belief in the message that we were putting forward and in this project transcended the sort of momentary discomfort of like, yeah, people on the internet are just going to be people on the internet. And that's not a good reason to self-censor. And you aren't doing yourself any favors by sort of like weaponizing your own editor brain against yourself. Thank you to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast and for supporting everything that we are doing at Running For Real in terms of the work that we try to put out into the world. We try to give back and I love that Tracksmith continues to support. And the other week, last week, I got to uh, try, go to a Twilight Tracksmith uh, me, and it was so much fun. I uh, paced two runners in the slower heat. One of the runners ran 11.45 minute pace, and the other runner was running about 7.45 pace. Um, and I absolutely had a blast. It was such a supportive and welcoming and inclusive community. I really loved the energy around the room and I encourage you to go check out those Tracksmith Twilight Meets if you have one coming up in your city there is an events tab on the Tracksmith website where you can go check out what is coming up you can also see long runs on there if there are long runs in your cities finally I want to mention just a few of my favorite items currently that I'm loving I don't actually tend to get many of the newer items because as I've mentioned many times Tracksmith quality is so high that the items I've been using since 2019 are still performing exactly the same as well as they ever did back then so I'm still using my same speed session shorts that I've been using for uh, four years now also the same with the sports bras that they've sent me and the tank tops I live in the various tank tops I I love the uh, session tank, the horizon tank, 
the Twilight tank. I have all these tanks that I live in. The Van Cortland tank is a fun one. Um, I definitely encourage you to go check out some of their tanks, some of their items that can be used in many of the different seasons. I love each of these uh, for life, but also for running. And if you use code Tina new, if you are a new customer, you can go to tracksmith.com forward slash Tina. If you use code Tina new, you can get yourself $15 off your order of $75 or more. If you are a current customer, you will get a give a donation um, and also get free shipping by using code Tina give. Um, and I want to encourage you to go check it out because one of the things you'll hear Zoe and I talk about often is that buying quality items is one of the best things you can do environmentally. So getting these quality tracksmith items will set you up for many years to come, meaning that you don't have to keep buying new items. So if you are ready to get something new, head on over to tracksmith.com forward slash Tina. Yes, yeah, so well, particularly with, you know, based on those people who are in the few, they are have a lot going on internally and are looking for ways to kind of get lash out to get um, to get some of that frustration out. And you and I have talked a lot with context of this book of that's one of the reasons we wanted this was to show people that it's not about finger pointing at one another. It's not about trying to be the perfect environmentalist, the perfect runner or any of it, but it's about like doing the best that you can leaning into the discomfort of knowing that you're not the best at this and that is okay, but you're doing the best that you can. Whereas those people that are going to say those things are people who are really struggling to to get to that place. Um, but you're right. It is scary. And I, it's interesting, Zoe, I've talked a lot about this with other people about how I'm trying, I wouldn't say bracing myself, but I know there are going to be some nasty comments coming our way. Um, and that would be a good point for people listening to this. Like if you can go leave a review, particularly if you brought this on Amazon or if you, but if wherever you got it, if you can leave a review, once you've read it, that will be huge for us because there are going to be some, some nasty things coming our way. And whenever I say that people, the person I'm talking to is like, Oh, well, you don't know that. And I'm oh, like, yeah. we, but, dude, I, but I do. <laughs> every day of my life. Every, yes. every single day, dude. Check out my DMs. Like, <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's hard because it's, I think some people see it as like pessimism, like, oh, well, you don't know that yet. But then at the same time that again, I feel like is a principle here is accepting and acknowledging that you're not going to get this right. You're not going to things aren't always going to be perfect. Things aren't always going to be seamless for your training. And like we've talked about um, on other podcasts about one of the chapters being when things are going on in your life or where it's particularly hectic, like you cannot expect yourself to perform at your running at the highest of high levels. If you are, you know, about to have a baby or if you are about to move house or any of these big things that are going on or even life stresses at work or little things all adding up. Um, and so, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how do you balance that, like mm. being realistic, but also um, being realistic with what's going to happen, but also maintaining that belief and positive focus in your life. Yeah, I think, I mean, something that's helpful for me is I, you know, I've been with uh, my coach, David Roche, since 2018. And that's obviously like a huge sort of under like principle that guides how he's been coaching me. And I think that it is sort of like a radical act of self-belief to be able to understand that stress is stress and that you like that the most productive training for any one point in your life isn't always the most you can tolerate. It's like what makes sense for that specific context. So mm -hmm. like right now, life stress is pretty high, but I'm training for a 100. I'm not doing the mileage that, you know, someone who isn't putting a book out, doesn't have a full-time job is, is doing. And that's not like a limitation. Like that is the best training for me. Like that is what I can do that will give me the best opportunity to show up at this race, um, and compete to my potential. So I think it's like about under like telling myself the story and also you know, again, like looking at the evidence that shows that the best training is the training that it, like is grounded in the reality of your life. That's grounded in the reality of your physiology. And that like, you don't need to train like a pro to have great results it would be great if I, you know, didn't have to mm -hmm. go to work. And like, if I could just take every afternoon to nap, but there's also a lot of like the people that I look up to most in the sport 
aren't those people. They're parents, Mm -hmm. they're activists, they're lawyers, they're, you know, folks that have a lot on their plates. And I think that that helps me feel more mentally and emotionally connected to the sport. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's, it's always a struggle because I have a human brain that always wants to be doing more, 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 (laughs) but Mm -hmm. thankfully I have people that, you know, love me and are there for me to remind me and and like, hold me accountable to that. Right. Like I I always tell like the people that I coach, like we need to build self-awareness and figure out like what your growth edge is for you and lean into that growth edge. My growth edge, a lot of times is doing less. So. Okay. Let's talk about that growth edge piece because I love that. And and that's one thing you and I have been very good for one another is, is pushing back, is pushing ideas, is, is, helping one another to be the best versions of ourselves, not just within this context of book writing, but, you know, as, as humans as a whole, um, I have really seen the importance of this in the last five or so years of finding people who do do that and not just kind of, you know, there's, there's accepting you for who you are, but then there's also, I love you for who you are, but I want the best for you. Um, and actually Ryan Montgomery gave me a really good example of Anna Mae Flynn, his coach and friend, saying to him at a struggle point in Western States, um, you got to push right now, like, and, and recognizing that he needed to be pushed in that moment rather than saying, okay, like you're doing the best you can let off the gas. Um, and that, you know, allowed him to get through the, the part to where he was able to push on and, um, and finish seventh, um, seventh, uh, and then, you know, eighth overall. Um, so I'd love for you to talk about that piece. Cause that's something that this friendship has really brought mm-hmm. to me is that growth mindset and knowing when to push one another and knowing when to just be like, you know, just, just let's hold up and, and hold on for the, through this part. Yeah. I think, you know, I mean, a, I'll just acknowledge like it takes time. That wasn't what our relationship looked like two weeks in, (laughs) you know, but like, you know, years along, you are that person for me. And I think you have like, you know, sent some text or voice moves where you're like, Zoe, like, I know that you have stuff going on, but you've got to get this chapter done because you are not the only person working on this project. Mm -hmm. And I think that that like, again, a speaks to how well, you know, me like, sort of honors the like time and emotional energy put onto our relationship and shows that you like recognize my values of like supporting the team and not letting people down. So like being able to speak to like you, like motivate people according to their values, I think is an amazing way that we can show affection and love for folks like saying like, I know what you're capable of and that's not what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Remember why you got into this. Here's your value. Here's what I think you're really capable of. Let's get there together. I think is a language that again, in relationships just takes a lot of time and takes like having been through challenge with people to see how they respond to challenge, how they respond to when you push them. Um, Because not everyone is going to respond the same way to like, Hey, now is the time to put on the gas some people are. And I think that again, like it just in a, in such a collaborative relationship, it just takes a lot of time and effort. And I feel really grateful. You know, we haven't spent a ton of time in person together, but I feel like Mm. we've just gotten so close because we've just had to like wrestle with tough questions around, you know, putting not only a writing a book together, but like around, a book that was like vulnerable and like touched on things that are really close to our hearts and are really like things that we believe in and have like professional and personal stakes in. And I think that that just, you know, again, like the whole, our whole relationship has been premised on a respect for those values from the beginning. So that makes having those tough conversations or saying, Hey, I know what you're capable of and that's not what you're doing right now. It makes those conversations feel so much more grounded and affectionate. Yes. Yes. And I mean, uh, you know, right back at you with, with all of that. And it's, it's just something I value so much is finding someone who is able to do that. And as you said, does understand you and what you need, because I don't know about you, Zoe, but sometimes I feel like I actually felt this last week at my strength training and I took, I sent a voice memo a few days later to my strength coach. He wasn't coaching me that day. He was away saying that basically I had a moment in my strength training where I felt like, I felt this, like, I can't do this, like Mm. this crumble about to happen with this coach who was taking over for him on that day. 
And so I recognized in that moment, like I was close to snapping in that, like how much mental energy I had to give. And so sometimes it is recognizing that someone doesn't need, you got this, like dig deep. Sometimes you need to just be able to say like, okay, that's what you got right now. Let's, let's just take that, just do the best we can. Um, but I just, I find it such a fascinating thing that we can find friends and find, we can all find people around us who are able to give you that nudge, but also recognize your boundaries of where you need to back off, even if it means, you know, a, a not as good performance or something doesn't come out quite, quite how you hoped. So I just find that such a fascinating yeah. topic and, and thank you for your explanation there. Yeah. I, just I mean, like, it. you know, that I love as, as much as running, I love comedy and I do both like stand up on my own and I have an improv group. One of the reasons I love improv comedy, which is like a team based comedy is because I believe because I've seen and experienced time and time again, that one, that what one person can create on their own will just mm. never have the same creative potential as what two people make together. And the tension of like having two different personalities, people, experiences, opportunities coming together to make something at the same time, like that will always be a much richer experience, not only for the, you know, the folks collaborating and creating together, but for the person experiencing that like that triangulation is always going to be kind of like a stronger more compelling um product than just what you know me shouting at someone essentially so true and that's the beautiful thing that came out of this book was us building on one another's words building on the things that we didn't know about uh you know what we what one person would write on like oh i didn't know that and also we can add this in and it it really worked that way so then i want to go into that the book was broken into three parts. We did it as like an individual lifelong runner, how you can have a good relationship to yourself, the sport. The middle section was about community, how that can level up your experience, how you want to give back, um, how you want to connect, how you want to build. And then the third piece was the environmental piece of, of, you know, being a good environmental steward to our land. But I think most people thought the book was going to be purely about the environmental side. So that was something that really surprised me that like people didn't, think we would write about the other piece of sustainability yeah. what has that been your experience and then is that what else has surprised you about this process yeah I think particularly just because so much of my professional writing has revolved around the environmental side of things um, mm -hmm. or a lot of the work that I do more publicly like my journalism but as a coach and a runner I'm obviously hugely invested in how you know like that sort of like individual thriving, that individual sustainability and how that interplays with the environmental side of things and with the community side of things. Again, I always sort of describe our book as a three-legged stool and without all three legs of like self, community and planet standing strong, then the thing doesn't really stand up. So our argument is premised on understanding that all of these things are interrelated and necessarily depend on each other. And I think that that's a really compelling argument. I think it makes our book pretty unique that we try to like put all of those things in context and in relationship with each other. And I think people are so used to seeing a book that only tries to like make one argument, like taking care of yourself is the most important thing or taking care of your planet is the only thing that matters. We wanted to write a book that was like, yes. And to all of that. Mm -hmm. So true. And I love that. Um, is there anything else that you think you, that the listeners should know about this book writing process? Man, process. Uh, it took us like a year longer than expected. Yeah. <laughs> I think Do you I remember when I said, deadline? I think in the um, April, I was like, can we get it out in like January? And Michelle, our editor was like, oh, no. <laughs> and yeah. then we were like, oh, actually, yeah, we'll be, we'll be lucky if we finish this. Uh, yeah, I think we ended up finishing it maybe like six or eight months after we first said when we wrote the proposal. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, again, like we just had other, like I had multiple like sort of career shifts, you know, you, you're, you're a mom, you ran a 50 mile race not that long ago. Like we have stuff going on and it, it, it is what it is. And I, you know, I think that looking back, I'm glad that things worked out the way they did, even though there were a lot of moments d along the way. I mean, and, you know, I think you, you and I have are both sort of like our approach to a lot of things in life is that more sort of mastery long-term approach. So it's not like 
a totally new experience for either of us to kind of just be sitting with that, like, I know this will feel worth it someday <laughs> kind of feeling. Yeah. But uh, there were definitely a lot of days where I was like, it will, right? Like, <laughs> this is going to be yes. good, right? <laughs> this yeah. is worth yeah. it, right? Yeah, I definitely felt that too. Um, okay. I... I'm trying to think if there's anything else that people had said to me. I mean, the biggest thing was them saying, oh, that was another thing people had asked me to talk about here. Um, I have said a few times in various places that uh, one thing that's hard about releasing a book and it being a longer process is that you, we had to release, I think we maybe gave the final draft in where we could make a few tiny tweaks in November, was it? Mm -hmm. Somewhere around there, December. Yeah. And so, it was, uh, yeah, it was like late because I remember <laughs> I was traveling to Mexico to race this 100 K and I was just like, man, I have not set myself up for success here. I was like editing <laughs> it by the pool, trying to like taper for this 100 K in Mexico. And I was like, I feel so bad for Tina. <laughs> when was that? Um, it was at the, uh, late October last year. Okay. Late October. Okay. Yes. So that would make sense. But but to me, I've said that I feel like I've grown and evolved and there was there's some things that I would have maybe not changed, but enhanced just some things, yeah. especially with the sustainability side that I feel are more important than I did back then or things that I that I uh, maybe went into a bit of depth on, like in my in my stories are things that I would have done differently now. Have you had that experience of, of feeling like you've evolved since then? Oh yeah. I think, you know, one of the most poignant experiences for me was like reading some of the life balance chapters, which is just like yeah. always a big, that's a, that's, that's my growth edge, <laughs> like eternally. Uh -huh. Maybe in one day, uh -huh. maybe in a year, I'll have like totally rocked that particular <laughs> challenge. Um, but I mean, I felt like going back and reading things that I had started writing when I was like 25, 26, I just felt a lot of affection and tenderness for that person. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like I was able to update a couple things that I didn't get right on the first try. And I'm sure if I read this book again in five years and 10 years, I'll want to keep updating the things I got wrong. But I also think that that's great and beautiful. And like a book is kind of more of like an intellectual snapshot, even though we really tried to make it feel comprehensive and like the best available resource and like get it as close to perfect as possible. It is and will only ever be sort of like a momentary encapsulation of mm. the people that were writing it. And like, we're very human and we, you know, even though we're like dynamic and changing, we kind of were who we were when we wrote it. And I hope that we keep growing and evolving as people. I hope that we, I really hope that we look back at it in five, 10 years and are like, yeah, I would have done a lot of things differently, but I'm proud of the effort I put into this. And I also know that we're going to continue to evolve our thoughts and our work in this area and update our approach and ideas as new and better information becomes available. So yeah. like, I think this, like we really did, our best. And I'm so proud of what we did. And I really hope that we continue to push back against previous iterations of ourselves and like stay soft and open-minded in this space. Yes, that's so true. It's, um, it is challenging in that way that we, yeah, as you said, it is a snapshot in time and you, between the time when we handed it in to, to now, we are different people, growing people. And as you said, in two years, we may not even agree with some of the things that we wrote. We may be like, well, I, I don't know if I agree with that anymore. And, and you kind of have to stand by it in some ways, but uh, that is the, that is the process. And on that note, um, you know, I, I know the answer to this, but like, is this something you feel like you want to go through the process again? Um, I'm or talking has it put with you the agent like later this week. <laughs> I yeah, feel like that idiot who like, you know, runs an ultra and is like barfing at the finish line and is like, I can't wait to do it again. Give me a computer to sign up for the next one. <laughs> I need another. Yeah. Um, but it's so true. Like, I love what a long-term process this was. And I think, again, like, I think a lot of runners and you particularly, you know, as you gear up for your next ultra, I think... I love doing challenging things and I love that process of just trying to master it. Like I, I love the process of it. I know I'll never write something that I feel hundred percent happy with, but I know I'll probably never get tired of chasing that either. Yes. No, it's, 
it's the beautiful thing about what we do together, but also just as we are as individuals. And I want to remind people listening that like, even if you're not someone who ever sees yourself writing a book or sees yourself as that kind of, as we talked about growth edge person, the someone who strives to do more, it doesn't mean that you can't set some version of that within your own life. Um, even if it may not be as big and lofty as what we're doing. And, and Zoe and I speak to that as well, that, you know, we, are talking about these things like concepts like not weighing our identity on on, on your running or, or or what you're achieving and what you're doing. But at the same time, we are kind of still falling for that trap of like ego t- tangled up in it. And uh, of course, writing a book is always going to be in part about like the validation that you get from it. And so I hope that, again, we chose that word becoming for a reason to show that we are not at the end point. We don't have this all figured out. We probably will make some of the mistakes we specifically said not to do in the book. Um, and and I think that's okay. So um, any, any thoughts on that before I ask us the last question? I would say, I'm, you know, I... I think everyone should write a book. <laughs> it's hard, but like we need stories. I think that increasingly a lot of folks are really gravitating towards rather than like wanting to scroll on their phone forever and reading depressing news. I think a lot of us want to read something that someone poured themselves into for a good amount of time. So even if you're the person listening and you're like, oh, my story's not important. I could never do this. I know for myself, I won't speak for you, Tina, but like I felt both of those things. I'm not important enough. I'm not good enough. My story doesn't matter a million times while writing this book. And here we are in pub day. I know. Yes. So exciting. So last thing I want to ask is I'm going to do the same for you. What is something that you want to share with the listeners that you either learned about me or that surprised you? Um, or just is funny or something. I, I, and I haven't pre-thought about this either. So I'm going to be doing yours on the spot. So yeah. just something that the listeners might not know. Um, I think we were, <laughs> we were joking that we both like our birthdays are pretty close. We're both August babies and we're both Leos, which like, as soon as I learned that I was like, yeah, that definitely makes sense. <laughs> like, I feel yeah. like we both exude like big Leo energy. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, yes. I think, and I think another thing that's like really delighted me in getting to know you is a lot of people, like we have had a lot of like discreet mutual friends, like a lot of people that were very close with separately. We're now close with mm-hmm. together. And it's kind of this thing of like, obviously the people that love us, like, love, cause we, we are pretty similar um, yeah. dispositionally as people. So I've just been delighted that so many people are like, yeah, I'm so, like, finally you guys met and are friends. <laughs> like, obviously yeah. we we're going to write a book together. You're so similar in so many yes. ways. So it feels like there was almost like, and, and again, like we're, we're very different, but it feels like there was almost an inevitability to our collaboration because we're so yes. interested in the same things that like, of course I was going to like fall into your orbit at one point or another. <laughs> well, that's actually similar to, to what I think comes to mind with, with the reverse of that question. And, uh, or my answer to that question is that I think like when you're someone who speaks very vulnerably to things and you really put yourself out there to try and, I, I really don't like the word ally, but try to be the ally, try to be the one who is speaking up and talking to these things. It can feel very lonely. It can feel like, what you're doing when you're doing this isn't enough ever, but it can also feel like the people that who don't understand that situation or that identity are uh, annoyed at you for speaking up to that. And so it feels like you can't win. And so for me, finding someone who I, who does that, who understands that, who feels that, but also um, who we are able to like be there for one another when this stuff is going on when things aren't working out. I've really loved that process. Um, and I just continue to feel in, in awe of you for, for continuing to do that. When, as you said, you get these nasty things sent your way, um, by people who just want someone to take it out on. And so that's been the biggest thing I've learned is when you find people who, go through similar struggles to you and understand those struggles, it can just mean the world to having that person um, who just knows it and gets yeah. it. So yeah, that's definitely oh, been the thing for me. I just think it's been such a gift. I know we're going over a little bit here, but like to have 
again, like, I think, you know, we started as friends and then I think it's like normal when you're collaborating on something very hard with someone to like have, it's not like we were ever not friends, but there were moments where it was like very much a professional relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think our relationship has evolved through so many just like beautiful stages. And now like you've become the person that when I'm going through some shit, like you get the first text, like you're the person that I send the voice memo to. You're the person who like, if I am not responsive on stuff for a couple days, like you check in on me. And I just, mm -hmm. I hope that everyone gets the opportunity to like be seen and known in their professional mm -hmm. and personal lives. in that way it is such a gift. There's just nothing like it. Mm, right back at you friend. Well, um, yeah, let's celebrate this coming out to listeners. If you haven't got us a co got a copy yet, go get yourself a copy. Go support us if you can leave a review. That's amazing. Yay. So we need any parting words. Excited to see you IRL. Yes, we're going to be together. Um, this will uh, this will come out after that. But uh, be sure to to check out um, our social media, or I will we'll have it on my newsletter, runningfreel.com, for you to go stay up to date with where we will be coming in the next few months. So you may well see us around. Um, love you, friend, and I'm just Would so you, thankful for this um, for this conversation and this collaboration. Yeah, it's, same. We've done it. We did it. <laughs> Holy shit. The Running For Real podcast and everything we do here at Running For Real would not be possible if it wasn't for the Running For Real team. While I am the person who you hear from most often and maybe the face of the brand, the rest of our team are such critical pieces of what we do. And without them, I think I'd just be running around in circles with ideas. So I want to take a moment to thank our team. To Jeremy Nessel, who's been with me since the very beginning. Kat McKay. Sally Pontarelli, Kelsey Wang, Sandy Gutierrez, Louise Murphy, Andrew Basola, Alexandria Will, and Maria Vargas. Thank you to each and every one of you for all that you give to Running For Real and our community. I appreciate you, and I'm so thankful for having you as a part of the team. I really love that conversation with Zoe. And as you can tell, we were both a bit tired, but we really wanted to make time to talk through uh, the launch and how we were feeling and what we learned in that moment on the day that it came out. So I hope you enjoyed that episode and reminding you once again, if you go leave a review on Amazon and you screenshot, send that over to sally at runningforreal.com. We will send you one of the training plans, one of the audio series or overcoming a menorrhea if that is what you want, whichever one of those you want, send an email to Sally and we will get that right to you as a massive thank you. I also want to encourage you to go check out our sponsors for today. You can get 15% off at twobefore.com and to Tracksmith. If you are a new customer, you can get uh, 15 off $75 or more by using code Tina new, or if you've already purchased something from Tracksmith, use code Tina give, and it will give you free shipping and you will make a donation. We will make a donation on your behalf. Go to runningforreal.com forward slash episode 364 to find out all that information and I will see you on Monday for a Together Run.